Okay, we're back at 2.30. So um, welcome back to our Suncoast Sisma Invasive Wildlife Workshop. We have our final speaker, Kaylee Spurgeon with us. She is the new Southwest Regional Biologist with the Division of Marine Fisheries Management. She joined FWC in 2016 as the lead for the Lionfish Control and Outreach Program before transferring to her newest position in October of last year. Her primary responsibilities as a regional biologist involve working with management and research staff on both state and federal fisheries issues, as well as serving as a liaison and resource for stakeholders and organizations within Southwest Florida. So um, thank you, Kaylee, for being here with us. She's gonna speak about the lionfish invasion, outreach, education, and control. Take it away. Great. All right, so we are going to talk about the lionfish invasion today. Um, like I said, we'll get into a couple of more different examples, but lionfish is really kind of the poster child for marine invasions here in Florida. Um, now, there have been multiple non-native marine fish found in Florida. However, most of these have not become established. Um, it's important to note uh, that especially down in Southeast Florida, you know, in, the Mi in Miami and the Keys, um, we do get lots of reports of fish like wrasses or triggerfish, or you can see some tang here um, that are introduced, but due to our quick detection and rapid response are usually able to be removed or they uh, are not able to reproduce effectively to establish. Um, lionfish, however, are marine fish that have become successfully established uh, in this non-native range, and they've been classified as the worst marine invasion to date. So here in Florida and in the Gulf of Mexico, we actually have two species, uh, different species of lionfish that have invaded, uh, Tarawa volatans and Tarawa miles. These two species are not visually um, distinct. You can only tell uh, which species you have unless uh, if you're doing genetic tests, uh, but they are a tropical predatory fish from the Indo-Pacific region. We first saw them here in Dania Beach, which is Southeast Florida back in the 1980s. And some genetic studies have reported that this was likely from an aquarium release of some kind, whether it was intentional or unintentional, we're not sure. Um, and there was likely multiple releases that occurred that allowed this species to establish a reproducing population. Uh, since that introduction, they've become well established in the Western Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And as I'll show you here in a minute, this invasion is not over. It's continuing to spread and something that we're uh, continually working on trying to manage as best as we can. Um, they are essentially the perfect invader in that they have a variety of characteristics that allow them to colonize habitats quickly, including a high reproductive output, a voracious appetite, a lack of any natural or consistent control mechanisms here in their invaded range, and of course their densities here far exceed that in their native range. Um, in the Indo-Pacific, if you're a scuba diver, you may be quite lucky to see a lionfish on one of your dives. However, um, here in Florida, depending on where you're diving and how far offshore, you're almost guaranteed to see a lionfish. So this map is going to roll through automatically, but before I do that, I wanna orient you a little bit. In the top left corner, you're going to see the date. So this time series will progress. Uh, we're starting here in 1985 when the first report of a lionfish was provided to USGS and Reef. Um, and you can see how it will quickly colonize um, the Atlantic Ocean first, the Atlantic coast, and move into the Gulf of Mexico. And those red dots there, those are individual reports of a lionfish. So you can see they start traveling up the Atlantic. We see them in Bermuda before quickly moving into the Caribbean and most recently the Gulf of Mexico and into the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so this is pretty startling. It, you know, it didn't take very long for them to be established. Uh, they travel primarily through the currents as juveniles or egg masses. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this invasion is not over. Uh, this map really only encompasses the Caribbean and the Gulf, but they do have the capability of colonizing further down the coast of South America, um, where they're really only limited by temperature water. Um, and the last thing that I will point out here is you can see that there have been reports of lionfish as far north as uh, New York. Um, however, they are likely not here year round because uh, they can really only survive uh, water temperatures above 50 degrees Fahrenheit and the water does get quite cold up there. So it's probably something that they uh, tend to move in or out or die um, once that water temperature cools off. So we see lionfish on a variety of natural and artificial habitats, including mangroves, seagrasses, estuaries, oil rigs, shipwrecks. Um, they are a demersal fish, meaning that they like the bottom, so they're not uh, pelagic or living in the water column. They really like uh, ledges and overhangs. You can find them in crevices. Um, and as far as depth range, we have seen them in waters as shallow as one foot and as deep as a thousand feet uh, through ROV footage. Uh, as I mentioned previously, they can tolerate quite low water temperatures for uh, fish that's supposed to be tropical in nature, um, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite cold if you've gone swimming um, on the Atlantic side that time of year. Um, and they have a pretty wide salinity tolerance. So anywhere from estuarine water, which is about four parts per thousand, to full sea water, which is about 35 parts per thousand. And so this is kind of a, a unique and interesting um, ability of the lionfish in that we are seeing them colonize those estuary environments and could be potentially impacting some of our brackish um, or some freshwater species when they get up into uh, rivers and estuarine environments. So lionfish reproduction. Uh, lionfish are sexually mature within their first year of life. That's about six inches. Compared to many other reef fish, they're not sexually mature between, until they're about five to eight years old. So once that lionfish is sexually mature, it can spawn an average of 30 to about 50,000 eggs every two to four days in the warmer months. So these guys um, are quite frequent spawners. Now, of course, not every egg is going to survive to adulthood, but this does show that uh, the, how quickly lionfish had been able to colonize uh, this invaded region through their reproduction. Um, now, so even though a female can spawn over 3 million eggs a year, as I mentioned, few do reach maturity, um, but the high percentage that does reach maturity, we think is likely because these eggs are encased in a floating gelatinous mass. Um, you can see that here in this bottom left picture, this is a single egg case of a lionfish. Um, and we believe that this egg case either has some sort of deterrent in it that either tastes bad to pretend, potential predators or perhaps it has um, some, some venom component as lionfish are venomous, which we'll discuss here in a second. Um, and as I said, the lionfish primarily um, travel through the larval phase and as egg masses, and they travel these large distances through the wind and current. Once they're adults, they tend to kind of settle out um, and they don't move very much at that point. So lionfish are venomous, they are not poisonous. That's probably one of my biggest pet peeves as a biologist um, working with lionfish. So poison uh, has to be ingested in order for you to get sick. So you wanna think about something like a puffer fish is poisonous if you ingest it, um, or a poison dart frog, whereas venomous, you have to be injected in order to feel those effects. So think about uh, spiders or certain um, species of venomous snakes or bees, right? You have to get stung or bit by those animals in order to be envenomated. So lionfish have 18 venomous spines total. Um, these spines contain grooves and they're not hollow, so they're not hollow like snake fangs. And if you can see my cursor here, um, you can see that these spines are covered up by a sheath of skin. So when you actually get stung by a lionfish, this sheath of skin depresses and it releases the venom through this groove. Now, the ones that you really have to watch out for that are venomous are these 11 to 13 spines here on their dorsal or their backside. 
and five on their ventral or their belly side. These big frilly fins that you see on the side here on the picture and in this diagram, those are their pectoral fins. They're real frilly, but they don't have any venomous spines on them, so you don't really have to worry about those. Um, the venom itself is a neuromuscular toxin that causes severe pain, swelling, redness, tingling, numbness, all kinds of different symptoms. Uh, depends on the person, depends on how bad you get stung, where you get stung. Um, however, the good news is that there have been no reported deaths from a lionfish sting. Um, I have some friends that have ended up hospitalized. Um, but no no reported deaths. So thankfully, this is not something that is extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, the best treatment for a lionfish sting is to apply heat. So think if you've ever been stung by a stingray, the treatment for that is very, very hot water. Same thing for lionfish. Because it's a protein-based venom, um, that heat will actually break down those proteins and take away a lot of your pain. So we recommend either heat packs or... Um, using the outboard of your engine if you're out on a boat um, or a bucket of hot water is usually what we'll take with us on our trips. Um, and of course, follow up and seek medical attention if needed. So lionfish have a very, very, very varied diet. That's a, a tongue twister. They eat both economically and ecologically important species. So economically, these are fish that we like to eat that are important to us in Florida and the seafood industry uh, here in the U.S. So we found juvenile groupers, snappers, and lionfish stomachs, as well as important bait fish that are important prey for those larger predators. We've also found invertebrates such as shrimp, crabs and lobster in their stomachs. Uh, for those of you that may not know, uh, this is a slipper lobster or a bulldozer. They're pretty common up in the northern gulf, but you don't see them as often as, say, the spiny lobster that Florida is very well known for down in the Keys. They also eat ecologically important species. So these are the fish that keep our reefs healthy, other fish on, on the reefs, such as cleaners. Um, we've got different wrasse and shrimp here that uh, keep these fish healthy by consuming parasites. And we also have grazers, things like parrotfish or damselfish that maintain the health of coral reefs by consuming algae. So when a lionfish is hunting, they have a pretty unique feeding strategy. Um, this is a study that was done in a lab with a captive lionfish. And you can see here in the top left diagram that a lionfish is here in the corner. We've got a small bait fish here in the petri dish. And this is a droplet of ink that was placed in front of the lionfish's face. So when the lionfish sees its prey, it actually blows jets of water towards, it, towards its prey, which in turn makes the fish turn around to face the lionfish head on. And this makes it easier for the lionfish to swallow its prey whole. So one, it makes them reorient so that they can better, uh, more easily consume their prey. Uh, and it also kind of disorients the, the prey item itself. And you can see as well in this diagram, um, in this photo, that the pectoral fins are kind of splayed out. They use those to kind of herd their prey into a corner before they slurp them up whole with that, uh, that big vacuum mouth of theirs. Okay, so we kind of breeze through some of the different characteristics of lionfish um, as being the perfect invader. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the effects on native ecosystems that that we're seeing here in Florida um, and throughout the invaded range. Um, so over 90 different species of native fish and invertebrates have been found in lionfish stomachs, so they are not picky eaters at all. Um, we've also seen a large reductions in recruitment and biomass of their prey species. Um, we also have effects uh, that we call non-consumptive effects, and this may include competition for resources such as shelter, um, or, or prey, so they compete with um, other reef species for those crevices and ledges that they like to hang out in. Um, they can also cause habitat degradation. Uh, and of course, there is an absence of natural consistent control mechanisms here. Nothing really eats lionfish on a, on a consistent basis to keep their prey, to, uh, to keep their populations in check. 
Uh, and these photos here are just to kind of show you the, the diversity of their diets. Uh, this is a bucket um, from one of our uh, lionfish festivals up in Pensacola that are pulled. You can see we had a razor, small pearly razorfish pulled out. We've got some squid here, um, some crabs, and I think there may have been a lobster in here. There may a slipper lobster but that may have been a different photo. And then this photo on the right is at a single site. It was a, a plane wreck off the coast of Pensacola. Um, and this was a site that is not, not uh, commonly dove by, by folks. So you can see that lionfish really just kind of colonize and it's just um, overrun with these guys. Okay. so. FWC operates on a variety of strategic initiatives. Uh, this has recently changed, or each every five years we kind of reevaluate the agency reevaluates its um, strategic initiatives um, to to most closely align with the current priorities that are going on in Florida to address emerging issues. Um, so this. Conflict Wildlife was the name of one of our agency strategic goals um, in the last cycle, and this was to minimize the health and safety impacts, environmental, social, economic, and anything, any other adverse impacts you can think of related to lionfish. And we try to do this, or the lionfish program tries to do this in three different ways. So this is encouraging removal efforts and increasing recreational and commercial harvest tracking. We have done that through removing uh, regulatory barriers, creating a variety of incentive programs, hosting and supporting uh, lionfish tournaments, and supporting innovative strategies for removal. We also are working to increase public awareness. We do this, we had or used to have, not so much now in the current times, uh, traveling Be the Predator outreach booth that we would bring with us to various events and festivals to educate um, people about the, the issue. Uh, we also go to schools and do workshops and dissections at dive shops. And we also have an annual event called Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day, um, which kind of kicks off our summer season of incentive programs. And lastly, we are trying to address this goal through promoting the consumption um, of lionfish and the development of a commercial market. Uh, and down there at the bottom, so since the, the beginning of FWC's lionfish program um, in 2014, uh, we have tracked the removal of over 689,000 lionfish from Florida waters. So now I'm not going to expect you, and I'm certainly not going to read through all of these regulatory changes, but this is just to give you kind of a visual aid um, about the various uh, regulatory moves FWC has made to try and address this problem. Uh, you do not need a recreational fishing license to harvest lionfish as long as you're using specific gear. There is no bag limit, no size limit, and no season. Um, we really just encourage folks to get out there and safely and effectively remove lionfish from the reefs. Um, some of the other uh, big points is we have allowed divers to use rebreathers to harvest lionfish. We've also prohibited the importation of live lionfish as well as the breeding and the possession of eggs. And some of the most recent um, regulatory changes that we've done through executive order um, is the lionfish for lobster incentive, which has essentially allowed for the past few years divers to harvest an additional spiny lobster per day over the bag limit as long as they qualify by harvesting a specific amount of lionfish uh, through one of our incentive programs called the Lionfish Challenge. So for those of you who may not be divers um, or have never harvested lionfish before, um, we humans are really the only predator uh, for this species here in the invaded range. Um, and models have estimated that about 30 to 65% of adult populations must be removed monthly to achieve substantial declines. So that's a big ask. Um, it's definitely a lot of work on both um, an agency perspective as well as folks who are out there on the water. Um, this is going to be an ongoing uh, mitigation effort. Lionfish are not going anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, the primary methods of removal for lionfish include pull spears, Hawaiian slings, spear guns. You can use hand nets. Um, folks use uh, slurp guns if they're capturing them live. 
And usually we like to recommend folks have some sort of puncture proof container. Um, there are a variety of containers out there on the market that are commercially available through dive shops or online. Um, however, I've also seen people um, create economic versions out of Home Depot buckets. So it's whatever suits you best. Um, and then, of course, you have this kind of small pull spear here that allows you to have a good control. And we also try and have folks uh, maintain, you know, good buoyancy. You're not wanting to uh, disturb the coral reef or create any additional damage while you're down there harvesting these fish, essentially making your work negligible. So thinking back to that three-tier um, strategies that we were going, uh, that I mentioned to you earlier, we have a variety of control programs in place throughout the state. Um, this includes um, tournament assistance that provides fundings to um, nonprofit and other organizations that are putting these tournaments on. Uh, we have various incentive programs that actually reward people for harvesting and turning in their lionfish. And then we have uh, some innovative strategies and new research and technology that we're supporting to uh, try and target those fish that maybe divers can't reach beyond those recreational dive limits. So we have various festivals. Um, our biggest one that's uh, pretty well known is Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day. Um, unfortunately, I did hear from my counterparts that now run the Lionfish program that this uh, festival did have to be canceled um, for 2020 in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, however, we're, we will be coming back next year if, if the situation allows and hope to see people there. Um, but these derbies, uh, in addition to this big festival that occur throughout the summer, have shown that they can reduce local lionfish densities by up to 52%. So they do help on at least a localized scale. Um, and this, this diagram here at the bottom just kind of shows you um, the, the number of tournaments has remained pretty steady over the years. Um, 2015 saw an unusually high amount, but it's usually about 30 tournaments a year removing anywhere from 15 to 25, 27,000 lionfish. Our next program is the Lionfish Challenge. This is a statewide incentive program that was established in 2016. And this was an expansion of the Lobster for Lionfish incentive that I mentioned on that regulatory slide back in 2015. Um, so this program coincides with the height of dive season when weather is usually uh, the most conducive for diving here in Florida um, and the waters are warmer. And essentially to qualify for this program, uh, divers have to harvest 20 lionfish before mini season in order to be able to get that extra lobster. Um, once you do qualify, we send folks a coin, a t-shirt, um, and recognition on our website. Uh, we also partner up with dive shops to serve as checkpoints, and uh, this essentially allows them to uh, har remove the tails from any additional lionfish and bring them to those checkpoints for verification. So as folks continue to remove lionfish and submit them to the program, uh, they can qualify for additional prize tiers that include uh, scuba tanks. Um, we give away uh, tumblers, harvesting gear, we have a variety of raffles, um, and towards the end of the challenge, the person who harvests the most lionfish, either in the recreational or commercial category, are crowned the lionfish king or queen and the commercial champion. And that comes with um, a big recognition, there's usually a trophy involved, we do a um, recognition at, at one of our meetings generally, um, and this includes uh, some cash prizes usually as well. So next, one of our next programs is, um, is actually two different programs, um, but they're the recreational and commercial harvest programs. And the goal here, at least on the recreational side, is to encourage dive shops and charter businesses to conduct lionfish specific trips. So to see lionfish harvest as an ecotourism opportunity. A lot of folks are very excited about it. Lionfish are very easy to harvest um, for, for beginner spearfishers. Uh, so we wanted to create this incentive for businesses that were already um, established and had, had the constituency 
to take folks out um, and and do good for the environment while also um, you know benefiting the local communities and local businesses. Um, we recently added on a commercial component this fiscal year um, to encourage those divers who do target lionfish commercially that have a saltwater products license to target and harvest lionfish. Um, and I believe uh, folks who participate in this program, commercial divers, I believe it's about $3 per pound um, in addition uh, to whatever they earn as, as they're, they're selling those lionfish. Um, and the goal here, again, is to increase the number of divers that are actually on the water harvesting these fish. And lastly, in terms of control, um, we have supported a variety of kind of unique and innovative um, projects to target lionfish below 130 feet. So if you're familiar with scuba diving, 130 feet is about the maximum limit uh, for recreational divers. Uh, there are technical divers that go through additional rigorous training so that they can dive to uh, greater depths, um, up to 180 or 200 feet. However, that is a very small population. Um, and as I mentioned in one of those earlier slides, we do see lionfish um, up to a thousand feet of water. So there are entire populations that we have historically not been able to touch. Um, and this has been through people have come up with innovative traps. You see in that, that GIF in the bottom right hand corner, that was a, a sort of purse trap that doesn't have a specific bait. Uh, lionfish are attracted to structure. So they just have this bucket here with different kind of uh, plastic um, legs to attract them to the structure. And once the trap is filled, manually pull up the trap. Uh, we also have folks who have developed very large ROVs um, that harvest lionfish at depth, um, controlled by a uh, technician at the surface that spears and uh, collects these fish. Um, and you know, the, these are all very, very exciting and there's some really neat things that we've learned through these projects. However, there we have, of course, run into some barriers um, and these could include existing state or federal regulations. And of course, you always have to consider the risk of bycatch or ghost fishing. Um, you know, in, in federal waters, we have, you know, imperiled species, um, turtles, whales, things that, you know, we're not wanting to contribute to any of those problems or entanglement issues. Um, and of course, you know, if you, if you lose your trap, if it's a trap that sits on the bottom, there's always that risk of bycatch and uh, capturing and continuing to kill fish that you're not intending to. So these are big factors that we have to keep in mind as we're developing these technologies. Okay, so moving into outreach efforts, um, we have uh, several programs here. As I mentioned earlier, we have the Lionfish Education Booth that travels around the states to events, festivals, and tournaments. Um, we have Become the Predator workshops. Those are usually us going into um, dive shops, and this includes demonstrations on proper harvesting, handling, um, how to properly fillet a lionfish to kind of take away some of that fear or maybe misconceptions of folks um, on handling these fish and showing them how to safely and effectively uh, do this themselves. Um, we also have the Lionfish Classroom Invasion Program, uh, which has been very, very rewarding. We have developed uh, multiple activities and curriculum that is available for teachers and it's on our website. Um, and, and the Educational Exhibit Program is meant for uh, areas where, where the public can attend, so with, whether this is museums or um, we have um, sites set up at airports, anywhere that the public could be widely educated, that we have funding available uh, to create exhibits that help get this message out. Uh, we also have several social media outlets, which I will link for you uh, towards the end of the presentation. All right, so I, I mentioned a couple of times now uh, that there is a commercial market for lionfish. Lionfish are edible. Remember, they're venomous, so that venom is only located in the spines of the fish. It's not in the meat. The meat itself um, is, is safe to eat. Um, it 
is very tasty. It's a, kind of a light flaky fish. I compare it to a grouper or hogfish um, in terms of taste and consistency. Um, of course, lionfish don't get as big as a grouper or hogfish, so you have to do a little bit more work in order to get that same amount of fillet. Um, lionfish get only to about 15 inches is probably the average maximum size here, uh, though we do have a record of a, I believe, a 19 inch, almost a 19 inch lionfish, so they do get pretty big. Um, but as I was mentioning, the meat itself is, is very, very good. It's very good for you. Um, and we have in the past several years seen an increase in demand for lionfish um, as, as a, a food source. However, consistent supply is difficult because this is primarily a diver caught fish. Um, other fish such as groupers or snappers um, can be targeted by hook and line or traps or trawls. Um, however, linefish don't often bite um, baits or hook and line. They're, they're really only targeted um, or efficiently harvested through diver effort. So as an agency, we do encourage commercial art harvest, but we have to walk this kind of fine line um, and, and have some careful mes messaging because we don't want this to become a managed fishery. Um, think of, you know, managed fisheries in terms of other fish that we eat, whether it's a grouper or a snapper. Uh, we manage those fisheries for their long-term well-being so that they continue um, to have an optimum yield so we can have them in the future. Whereas lionfish, we're technically trying to collapse this fishery, right? We want to eliminate them um, from the invaded range. So it's something that we're, we're always cognizant of and try to be careful of. Um, Divers need a saltwater products license in order to sell lionfish commercially, and they have to do that, of course, to a licensed wholesale dealer because once you are entering the seafood market, you get um, other health concerns and you have to be cognizant of, you know, how, how you're harvesting your fish. Um, in terms of cost, uh, fishers are getting anywhere from four to six dollars a pound per lionfish, and in this table, here at the bottom, you can see I need to update um, this. I'm a couple of years behind at this point, but there was a huge uptick um, in commercial harvest that kind of went in line with, you know, increased outreach efforts as, as the word got out, as we were working with our partners um, across the state, local um, nonprofit organizations, people really started to kind of get on the wagon um, and harvest these guys commercially. Oops, excuse me. Um, and you can see that this blue bar here, the blue represents diving, that most of these um, landings are coming through scuba divers, with some coming from hook and line is probably second, with trawls a close third. This drop here was really interesting to us. Um, it, not quite sure what that could mean. Um, Perhaps we are seeing that lionfish are being controlled well on a local scale um, and that those commercial landings, you know, had dropped. So maybe we are seeing success in terms of uh, lionfish being controlled, at least in those areas that we can reach. Um, of course, we still have the issue of uh, deeper lionfish populations, which is, is a continual uh, point of work for us and others. Um, and I think it's also important to note here that we did, I think in 2018 and 2019, saw the emergence of an ulcerative disease of lionfish. So they were um, had some, some sort of pathogen that was making them sick and sick. And when they were harvested, you could actually see lesions on these fish. Um, there was a study that recently came out um, that was kind of quantifying this, trying to attempt to see what effect this may, this pathogen may have on the population. Um, and it, it did indicate that this may have kind of knocked their populations back a little bit. Um, however, it does seem to be that it's kind of toning down uh, and that populations uh, would expect to rebound to a certain degree. Um, now I know the next question is, is this uh, transmissible? Uh, we are not entirely sure. We had not seen any other uh, ulcers or anything on any other fish uh, in, in this study. 
um, but it's something that our, our fish health folks over in FWRI are continually monitoring, um, and we're always looking for you know reports. There's a, a fish health hotline that you can call into if you see a line fish with the um, this, uh, but that that really is something that uh, we we think may have impacted um, commercial harvest um, as well as. We had, you know, some pretty strong hurricanes in 2018 and 2019. So that certainly affected folks' ability to get out in the water. Okay. All right. So in the future, of course, you know, there's always more work to be done. Um, as a program and as an agency, we continue to look for ways to encourage involvement in this process in both removal and awareness. Um, outreach, of course, is a huge component to encourage the general public to take action in this issue um, and take ownership of this issue. Um, we need to constantly be uh, adapting our strategies to keep up with this invasion. There's always new uh, research coming out, so we want to make sure that our messaging is consistent and accurate. Um, the continual um, evaluation and removal of any potential regulatory barriers to a harvest and removal of lionfish and of course, continuing both of our exi existing and developing new incentive programs for lionfish removal. Um, of course, too, we're also always looking for additional funding opportunities um, to support innovative strategies, uh, looking to fund research in, uh, on gaps in both our knowledge of biology and the ecology of lionfish that may yield some clues as to how to uh, best control this species. And of course, subsidizing recreational and commercial removal efforts. Right, so now this is kind of a, a new, new kid on the block, uh, potential invasive species. Uh, this is called the Regal Demoiselle. It's an Indo-Pacific damselfish uh, that was first recorded in 2013 in the southwest Gulf of Mexico and has been recently documented um, in fairly large numbers in the northern Gulf. Um, genetic studies have indicated that uh, this fish, unlike lionfish, which was introduced through likely through the pet trade or the aquarium trade through um, releases, was probably introduced through uh, translocated petroleum platforms um, that, that tend to move around, whether they get moved for artificial reefs or a platform gets moved because uh, that rig is no longer uh, in use. Um, and because this is a small damselfish um, and, and quite different from a lionfish, potential ecological impacts here are unknown and they're very difficult to predict. Uh, this is a much smaller species of fish uh, that would be much more difficult to control and remove. So this is something that uh, we're keeping an eye on um, and continue to work with our partners such as USGS. Uh, we work quite closely with Reef down in the Keys and other nonprofit um, and governmental organizations on both the lionfish issue and any emerging marine invasive species as well. And so with that, I want to point you to a few resources. Uh, if you wanted to learn a little bit more about lionfish, you can visit any of these websites that are uh, um, our main FWC website, lionfish page. Um, if you are a teacher that would like some more information on the curriculum we have available, we also have social media outlets through Facebook um, and a website. And of course, you can always email our lionfish team at this email address, lionfish at myfwc.com. Um, I've also got some other, if you're more interested in some other non-native marine species, can, can look at these links as well. And I'd be happy to send them to you uh, via email. And with that, I'll leave you my contact information. As I mentioned, I, I used to only be lionfish, but I am now based here in Southwest Florida and deal on a variety of fisheries issues. So if you are from this region and you are an avid angler or spearfisher or just concerned about the resource, I'm always help, happy to help answer questions and just feel free to reach out to me at any point.